maybe I should just say a, a very few words briefly to um, introduce you to the reason that we are here uh, uh, as uh, English people and the reason that um, I was fortunate enough and blessed enough to be able to acquire uh, this beautiful property. Um, I was always very interested. I'm not a, an artist, I'm not an architect. Um, I can't think in three-dimensional terms. Uh, I can't draw, but I've loved architecture ever since I was a small boy. And um, I've also lived in the United States, in, uh, really in Chicago and New York. And uh, on one occasion, I thought to myself, well, if you're so interested in architecture, Peter Colombo, you should really go and see the great house, which is Falling Water. Uh, so I did. I went there in 1984, had lunch there. Uh, the director showed me round. And uh, before I left, it was a memorable day, beautiful day. He said, I think you should see the other Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, in Pennsylvania, which is only six, down, six miles down the road. And by the way, it's for sale. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I beetled over here. And there was no one around. It was completely empty, had the place to myself, walked around the house, fell in love with the outside. I thought to myself, it's as beautiful inside as it is out, uh, then I must come back and do something about it. So I came back six weeks later, met the owners, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hagen, who were charming, charming people. And, and I, bought the, I bought the house that afternoon. And the interesting thing was, as I explained to some of you already, this evening, um, the house had been on the market for three years, and there had not been one single expression of interest, let alone an offer, uh, during that time. So I like to think the house was waiting for me, <laughs> and fate was playing its hand, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be here, uh, and... Well, the rest is history. Carlos, as our guest, um, welcome again. What do you think of the high life and times of Frank Lloyd Wright? <laughs> well, as, um, as, uh, as I started with my disclaimer, I'm not an authority on Frank Lloyd Wright, but I would like to follow on your, on your introduction to, uh, to Kentuck now, because it, it seems rather appropriate that you, you begin with this introduction to a heroic piece of architecture as, as falling water is. It has become a, a figure in the landscape of architecture that is immediately recognized as, a, as the, the, the best of Frank Lloyd Wright, and yet you find this gem of a house completely nestled in this hill that suddenly makes you even forget that momentary love affair with falling water. So this idea that, that, that Frank Lloyd Wright could exist in this uh, realm, this, this uh, not oppositional realm, but can exist with the magnitude of this muscular work in, in, in this river, uh, this creek, sorry, I don't need to sound like a Texan, suddenly <laughs> <laughs> exaggerating, exaggerating a creek into a river, but you know what I mean. But I love this idea that you fell in love with this humble house, with someone that was forgetting his passage on earth, and then you found this uh, moving, portrait to invest that afternoon that I find that story quite amazing and, and more so than uh, I'm sure we'll get to the high times but I have not heard this story mm -hmm. so so strategically placed in one afternoon that you fell in love with the house and decided to buy it uh, after that encounter but I um, yeah, I, tell, I told my wife when we met that I fall in love very easily <laughs> <laughs> can be dangerous. And we seem to um, share a kind of a fascination with a, uh, an individual that if you think about it, uh, there are very few Americans that have done this. I, I'm not, uh, I mean, I think of my present hero, Bob Dylan, who has manufactured a life of many dimensions, like Wright did, and always a rebirth. You know, it's a kind of fascinating American tradition of this rebirth. It's, it's a place where you don't need to be in allegiance with some particular uh, heritage or lineage, you can rebirth yourself. And Frank Lord, Lord Wright represents that kind of a 
<coughs> instantaneous rebirth. But I, I like the idea of comparing him with, with Bob Dylan, because Bob, <laughs> yes, Bob Dylan obviously was Robert Zimmerman, and yes, yeah, Robert Bob Zimmerman, Dylan, yes. and uh, Bob Dylan, and he invents his and, life, and he really invents his life, but constantly is reinventing <laughs> what he's doing. And Wright is one of those architects who seems to have had this ability, who had this ability, to surprise us. Mm. Every couple of years, he would pull a new rabbit out of the hat, yes. let's say. And I think there's something going back to this issue about Americanness. I think he is one of the great, in fact, American artists. Yes. Uh, in part because, and I should of course also say that this year is the 150th anniversary of his birth, uh, right? Which is why we're here, I think, yes, for, the, for, celebrate. For, for these events. He had an incredibly long life, so he lived to be, what, 92? Well, it depends, depends, depends who, who you believe. believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. often a little unsure yes. with Frank Lloyd 67, Wright. 69. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but he had a very, very long life. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this notion of Americanness, I think, which is so central to him, in fact, uh, and maybe to Bob Dylan as well, it's not by chance that they came from from, from, the, from the middle of America, part, not yeah. from the coasts. And if you think about architecture in America in the late 19th century, um, the expected thing to do for a brilliant young architect was to go to Paris. So if you were, you know, in Boston or in New York, off he went to the Beaux Arts, like uh, Richardson, for example, mm. or Sullivan, or mm. Henry Hornbostel, our own Henry Hornbostel mm. in Pittsburgh, who I think is a greatly underrated uh, architect. Uh, that was the thing you were supposed to do, and Wright didn't do that, in part because I think he didn't have the funds to do that. But there's something about his spirit in Wisconsin that is mm. quintessentially American in the sense of a democratic uh, uh, America. I think he felt that he was born under a star. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are people like that, and they are infinitely interesting people. Um, you can call it uh, arrogance, you can call it uh, conceit, you can call it genius, mm -hmm. and it's all those things. But there are people around who are definitely feel that they're born under a star and that they can do anything and that they can take anyone in any direction that they like to, to, to do. I really think that he is um, one of the greatest architects, not, not of, simply of his time, uh, which started in the 19th century, but of all time. And it was interesting when I had the privilege of knowing Mies van der Rohe towards the end of his life. He was, 75 when I first met him. I think I was 24. Uh, but uh, he was my hero. I started from that uh, thing. And Mies was a man of few words. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was a man of many words. <laughs> <laughs> the, Welsh, the Welsh Celtic gene. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wrote, he wrote in his life over 100,000 letters. Mm. I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary wordsmith. But me said to me that when um, Frank Lloyd Wright came uh, or was forced to go to Germany uh, in uh, the early part of the, uh, of the 20th century in, and uh, exhibited a small collection of his drawings in Berlin in 1911, me said that they didn't know his work. I mean, it seems uh, ridiculous nowadays, but they did not know his work, and that when they saw it, not only Mies, but Behrens and all the people there, Gropius, uh, for them, life was never the same again. Mies, of course, came, came over, over to the United States uh, in 1937-38 to escape the Nazi uh, regime. And he was followed by uh, a town planner, a very famous town planner, called Hilbersheim. Hilbersheim. And um, they met Frank Lloyd Wright in Chicago. And uh, for some event or other, uh, it might have been the event when uh, Frank Lloyd Wright introduced... He was a mentor of Mies van der Rohe. Uh, he, was, he introduced him to American, uh, the American establishment and the American uh, architectural profession. And it was, it was a famous occasion when um, he got up at a big dinner 
for the, at the Armour Institute, which Mies had been made a director of. It's now called IIT in Chicago. But it was then called the Armour Institute. Mm. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mies van der Rohe. Without me, there would be no Mies van der Rohe. <laughs> <laughs> A typical, typical um, Frank Lloyd, and sat down. That was the end of the speech. And then he walked off, walked off the platform. But you know, Peter, following on that, I mean, one of the my favorite quotes about Wright's um, uh, extreme confidence, I would say, <laughs> is that when uh, he was interviewed, actually in Houston, and he was interviewed, and, and he said, So, Mr. Wright, how do you came to be? An architect. So, well, first of all, I never tried to be an architect. I never was educated to be an architect. And least of all, I was never mentored to be an architect. I was born an architect. <laughs> and it was during a time when he got the gold medal uh, in 1949, I believe. And he was uh, his typical uh, confident self to insult the host of, uh, <laughs> right away by uh, he was taken to this fantastic hotel that was the pride of Houston at the time, and it was called sadly for for this the uh, host the Shamrock, and yeah. Mr. Wright looked at the Shamrock and he says, "Well, how, what do you think, Mr. Wright? This is our pride and joy." And he says, "Well." <laughs> He looks to me like a lot of sham and very little rock. <laughs> and sure enough, sure enough, it was it was very truthful because the hotel only lasted maybe three decades, and it was actually built out of uh, plastic formica that looked like marble and things yeah. like that. So it was really a kind of sham, but he didn't know that. Yeah. So his kind of instinct to be so receptive to something that was visceral to his sensibility you know, was very striking. And he had this ability, this isn't, of course, taught in architecture schools, but he had an ability to every, perhaps every decade or so, he could find a great client. And when I say a great client, I don't mean the client for one project, I mean the client for multiple projects. So the Martins in, 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 uh, in, uh, Buffalo. in Buffalo, Buffalo, for example. Uh, and then, of course, Mr. Kaufman here in, 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 in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and, of course, the prices then in, in Bartlesville in Oklahoma in the 50s. So he had this ability of finding these very interesting clients. So this was a way for him to, 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 to bounce back. He could, he could convince these clients to build many more things. So Mr. Price, for example, the man in, in, Bartles, in, Oklahoma. in, in Oklahoma in Bartlesville, their business was in oil pipelines. And his sons were encouraged to think about uh, architecture because of the, uh, they were at the University of Oklahoma and they're an inspirational teacher. And that's often a very important uh, thing, of course. And um, so Mr. Price went to see Mr. Wright. And he went and his own s joke, at his, slightly at his own expense, is that he went and expecting that Mr. Wright would design a three-story office building in the center of Bartlesville. And his joke is that as he left the meeting, he said, well, we compromised on 18 stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's still standing. It's, it's still, still standing. It's, still, it's, still it's, standing. A, it's a great hotel now. Yeah. So Wright had this idea in his mind about making a high rise based upon a tree. So again, an organic idea. Of course, this is his big thing, organic architecture. And he had proposed a project like this at many stages, but never was able to realize it. So I think when he saw Mr. Price wandering in, looking for a three-story high office building, he thought, I found my man. <laughs> and the other, the other wonderful story, <clears throat> the other wonderful story was that at the Guggenheim Museum, which, as you know, is, uh, is, uh, so goes that. round and round and round and round and round. Uh, the... The then uh, director, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, James Johnson Sweeney, uh, wondered how on earth, the, the inaugural exhibition was Jackson Pollock. Uh, big paintings, uh, 10 feet long and four or five feet high. And how was he going to hang these on a, on a curving wall? <coughs> So they went round to the uh, they went round to the storage place where these paintings were due to be hung uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright, and he said, "Mr. Wright, uh, this is a very beautiful building, but how can I possibly hang a painting which is ten feet long <laughs> and four or five feet high uh, on a curving wall?" And Frank Lloyd Wright went up to it, and he looked at it, and he came up to it, and he looked, and he went back, 
And then he pointed with his cane. He said, this is about the middle of the painting. This is where we make the cut. <laughs>